Daniel Ewan was 16 years old in 2004 when he went missing from Running Springs, California from his boarding school. The name of the boarding school was SIDU Running Springs, and it was a therapeutic boarding school known for its tough love approach. It was the last alternative for families who struggled with out-of-control kids. You may have heard the name SIDU because Paris Hilton brought it to mainstream media when she talked about it in her documentary. She had spent a couple months there and in their sister school. I happened to go to this school. I went there for two years and seven months. I graduated from this school when I was just shy of being 17 years old. I blocked out my experience from the day that I walked off that campus. Recently, and it wasn't even that long ago, I heard that it had been shut down years ago for accusations of abuse and children that had gone missing. When I was at CEDU, we learned that CEDU, spelled C-E-D-U, meant see yourself and do something with it. And we heard that over and over and over, but it wasn't until recently that I heard that those letters actually might have meant Charles E. Diedrich, who was a leader of the Synanon cult. So I had to stop and think, did my childhood end abruptly when I walked onto that campus when I was 13 years old? Did I follow with blind faith and spend my teen years living in a cult? My next guest I'm so excited to have because I've never met him and I've heard so much about him, is somebody who is a journalist and a podcaster. He um, had um, an amazing podcast that when you guys are done listening to this one, you should go on and listen to called The Lost Kids, where he talks about the disappearance of Daniel Ewan, and he talks about Sidhu. Um, And then his other podcast that is absolutely spectacular is Escaping Nexium, which we will also get into, which is about a self-help group turned into a sex cult. So without further ado, hey there, Josh. (laughs) Hello. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Thank you so much for coming. So I wanted to start with, how did you get into being interested in Daniel's case? Yeah, I mean, I, the connection actually in a roundabout way came through doing the Nexium podcast. Um, NBC uh, had started this podcast studio. They were interested in investigating CDU and they knew about this connection to Synanon. And I, I, because I had been working in the cult space, they had reached out to me to host it. Um, and it is, you know... It, it turns out that, you know, not just that connection to Synanon, but the way that CDU operated itself had so many similarities to the way that that high pressure organizations, high control groups, cults actually operate. So it turned out that the the research I had done on Nexium and the kind of the deep dive I had done into the cult world uh, was very useful in investigating this program as well. So uh, it's interesting because in listening to your podcast of The Lost Kids, It was widely known, even by the, I guess, the staff members, that it was based on the Synanon cult, but none of us knew about it. Our parents didn't know about it. A lot of the parents that dropped off kids there literally had no idea that there was such a connection and there were, you know, things that literally went from the teachings of Synanon directly into the teachings and the curriculum of SIDU. Will you explain to people who don't know what the teachings of Synanon was and then how that went into CDU. Yeah, I mean, and it's really interesting that you're pointing that out because there's two different versions of what CDU is. There is the version that was advertised to parents to get their kids to say, it wouldn't be a good calling card <laughs> to say, you know, come send your kids to a, a cult synonym spinoff. Uh, so there was a version that was advertised in the brochures and the websites um, and in the meetings. And then there was a version of actually what was going on. So uh, Synanon was uh, it, it was an organization that started a group that started in, in the 50s by Charles E. Diederich um, as an alternative to Alcoholics Anonymous. At the time, they weren't accepting drug addicts into Alcoholics Anonymous. And he felt like and he was a recovered alcoholic himself. And he says that, you know, he noticed this rise in addiction, uh, you know, attached to perhaps the 60s counterculture movement, um, but just noticed that a lot of youth he felt were off course and certainly a lot of um, adults were, were suffering from addiction and created this program. But really, uh, you know, he has no credentials in terms of, th- you know, a therapeutic background or a social work background or a psychology background, but came up with this idea of using uh, an aggressive form of attack therapy as like that was like the therapeutic core of Synanon for Uh, an hour and sometimes hours and sometimes days, people would be put into this very high pressured environment where you'd sit in a circle with your um, with, with the other participants in the program. One person would be in the hot seat. 
and they would be attacked. They'd be screamed at, yelled at. I mean, there was only two rules, which was that you couldn't threaten violence or be violent. Other than that, it was no holds barred. You could do, uh, you could say whatever you want. Um, and this idea of of using the the idea that you know his logic was you use this tactic to show the person something truthful about themselves. That if after an hour of being screamed at and yelled at and about y- your flaws, that somehow. Um, so I suppose you would see see something about yourself and see do something light, about it, so to speak. That's right, um, and and so that you know it, the 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 Synod on House when it started was kind of like this fashionable play. It was in L.A. It had like lots of connect, connections to Hollywood. A lot of celebrities would come through it. It kind of was part of this whole human potential and counterculture movement that was happening. Um, and people really raved about it and and found that it was like it, that you know there were all kinds of uh, anecdotal success stories for folks, but uh, the organization started to shift. Um, and and one of the you know one of the key changes was when Charles Diedrich said, you know, th- this is a two year program, and and after two years it'll be rehabilitated. And then he shifted to say uh, rehabilitation is a lifelong process, and therefore you can never leave C- uh, Synanon. You have to be part of, a part of it forever. Um, and and then a whole bunch of you know they became quite violent um, and uh, and and started behaving in. You know, they were called one of America's most dangerous cults. But what happened was is that people from that that um, organization and affiliated with that organization started to scatter and create uh, a synonym-like program for so-called troubled youth. They, they borrowed the vernacular. They borrowed this therapeutic model of attack therapy, of a kind of shame-based attack approach to helping people, and they applied it to young people. Um, and you know, and and it was the seeds, and eventually would become this billion-dollar industry, uh, the, what we call this, the, the troubled teen industry. And the connection to Sidu is really profound because Sidu becomes this foundational moment where you see that philosophy jump over from Synodon, and and it becomes in a lot of ways the model that dozens of other schools, maybe even hundreds of other programs, um, use uh, after CDU uh, creates it under under Mel Wasserman, its founder. Right. So you bring up Mel Wasserman. When I went there, I went in, I guess, the end of 1989. And so I was there somewhat at the beginning. I mean, it had been around for a decade at least, right? And But Mel was a figure like our God, kind of. We heard about him, you know, um, you know, in the, in the rafters, and we would always wonder if he was going to show up. And our headmaster at the time was Bill Lane, who I think you spoke to. Um, and Rudy Benz was my, you know, family head, who you also spoke to. So watch, oh, wow. listening to your podcast, I had to really stop and hold in a lot of emotion because the voices I heard were voices that um, affected my my childhood and my and my teen years for many years. But what you say and bring up is really interesting. None of these people had credentials. So Mel Wasserman was a furniture salesman, right? I mean, this That's is right. the guy who started my school that we thought was this amazing school at the time and had been told, we are doing things that kids your age never get the chance to. And the price your, your parents are paying to send you here is like the price of what people are paying to go to the highest co- end college ever. And you don't know how much your parents care about you. But when we were there, we did not feel like that. Some of the kids that would arrive there would be kidnapped in the middle of the night and brought in at all hours of the morning and not know why they were there. For me, my situation was very similar to many people's situations where we thought we were visiting. I just thought I was there on a tour. And by the time I was up in the dorms being shown what the dorms look like, my mom had left. And I had to spend, you know, the next almost three years there and had no way out. And it was terrifying for a young girl who had never done drugs, had never had sex, never really do, did anything awful. You know, the most kind of awful thing I had done was be very combative with a single mother and, you know, um, who didn't know how to deal with me. And mm. but but you did see a lot of kids coming in from the California, um, you know, they were having issues and the the courts would send them there, right? right? So I think they did get funneled in through that way. And it would be very interesting to see how their reaction would be versus someone who was like, why am I here? I, I really don't get what I did that was so awful. But the staff had no, to get back to what I was saying, the staff had no credentials, not only right. Mel Wasserman, but the staff who was around us on any given day, right? Is that what you found in your investigation? 
No, totally. I mean, it, there were staff members that seemed to literally be plucked off the street. I mean, they, you know, people were coming with zero background in in therapy or, or often working with kids at all. Um, there was, as you know, many people came through the program, ended up being staff. So their training was just being participants in the program and their only exposure to what therapy would look like was this that the form of attack therapy that you guys were doing. Um, so it is, I mean, I was shocked by that. And, and you know, in the podcast, we do talk to Ruby Benz, uh, Rudy Benz. I, I, I was, um, I was surprised that he was going to speak, but I also was surprised, you know, that the, there was a sense that he questioned the value of the program on some level, or he was open to some of the criticism, but fundamentally still seemed to stand by the this idea that like what I saw was people change. What I saw was that if I if, that I could modify and control the, the behaviors of of troubled kids by using this. So I don't know, maybe like for ten percent of the kids that went there, it was traumatic, but like for eighty percent of them, it, it was it was profoundly. And, and people come to me today to say there was a difference. Um, so well, that's what I was yeah, gonna. Like to that's say, what yeah. I was gonna ask you. What was your? What was the reaction from people that heard your podcast from former students? They must have reached out. How many said it was good versus bad? Um, you know, there was a point that we. So tons of people reached out after the podcast came out. And also I spoke to dozens of, of former residents uh, in the process of putting together the podcast. It was very difficult to find folks who still supported it. Um, it's there. There, I mean, I'm sure, sure you've seen people on on social media and Facebook and, and people did pop out. And we do include, I think in like the sixth episode, we did include a clip of someone who said, eh, it might not have been for everyone, but it was you know, it was transformative for me. Um, but I have my experience was that that was the exception. I think a lot of people um, seem to have an experience that you had, which was I didn't talk about it. It was deeply traumatic. I had no way of even I mean, part of I, I think part of, you know, Daniel Ewan's time and certainly your time was this before social media. There was no it was so difficult to form a community and to try and process what happened. And you're in your teens. You're already trying to understand how the world functions and who you are and kind of putting together what the world looks like and to suddenly be dropped into this surreal, uh, you know, high pressure environment, uh, I think for a lot of people was incredibly traumatizing. And because uh, and so for a lot of people I talked to, they were like, I haven't talked like, you know, like you, I hadn't talked about this in decades. I didn't know how to even put a put a, there was no language I could use to describe what was ha- happening. And I think that that has shifted for a bunch of reasons, um, including social media. But uh, but trauma, I think, was was a primary response I heard from from people that went to the program. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say that because I pushed it down so much and didn't want to think about it. But then when I did think about it, it was very traumatic. There's so much that has to do with shame and humiliation from that school. Um, You know, let me just start with explaining to people what it was like. So first of all, there's a certain like vernacular when you go there. There are certain words that you follow. And when I hear these words, you know, your mind changes or certain music, you know, if certain songs come on, sometimes I have a physical response and I don't even know why. And then it will occur to me. Like, I can't listen to John Denver. I can't listen to Kenny Loggins. I can't listen to Crosby, Stills, and Nash because those were, we were only allowed to listen to certain music when we were there. And it was on repeat in that main house all the time for, you know, the years that you're there. And um, the songs play over and over in your head and that's all you can kind of sing. Otherwise, you're out of agreement. The entire school is about being in agreement. And if you're not in agreement, you're punished. And you're literally punished for almost everything. And when you have to, um, you, you, you need to come clean. You need to cop out to the things that you're guilty for. So you're constantly either guilty or you're on, you know, you're, you're doing something good. And if you're guilty and you're copping out, you're on a ban from people. You're not allowed to smile. You're not allowed to touch people. You're you're constantly on work assignments or you're on writing assignments. You're alone. You're scrubbing the floor with um, a toothbrush. You know, you're working on a farm for six months. You're chopping wood for six months. And that's not even if you're 
in a bad place. That's what you have to do there. That's what our curriculum was. We didn't go to school for the first year that we were there. Our school was physical school. You know, it was uh, every morning until 12, you have to do something physical beyond the farm or chopping wood. And then in the afternoons, you went to raps, which is what you're talking about, which was the game, the, the, where you're being attacked for three hours, where you sit in a circle And they would call off your name Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and you would be in a room with 15 to 20 people, and you would be attacked. And it's almost emotional for me to talk about, I have talked about this in so many years, but they would find something. You could not get out of the room without them finding something to attack you for. And it wasn't just attacking um, so, I mean, it could just be the smallest thing. If I was making noise with the spoons in the dining room, they would use that and say, but you only want attention. And it would go into God knows what, and the entire room would get on board and start screaming at you. And the kids would have to get up from one side of the room, change chairs to yell at you, and you couldn't survive right unless you had an emotional breakthrough and started crying and screaming and hitting the floor to have this breakthrough. And you had to do this three times a week for years. And it was horrible. So they had to break you down. I'm so sorry that I'm crying. But they had to break you down to build you back up. And it was horrifying. And then at the end, you're sort of like, they go around, how was your rap? And I remember everyone's response. Oh, it was really hard, but good. It was, you know, I feel good. I feel right. really, I feel like I'm really making progress. I mean, that's crazy. It's crazy. It, it, it is. I mean, it took me so long to even try to wrap my head around this. And I, and I felt like, you know, making the podcast, I, it felt like a daunting task. of like, how do you even describe this weird alternate universe that, that people are dropped into? And I think like one of the things about CDU as compared to there, I've, you know, there's definitely been cases and allegations around sexual abuse and physical abuse at CDU. Other programs employed that even you know more as a tactic. But I think one of the challenges with CDU was that the abuse was psychological, and in some ways that abuse is is, is invisible, and it's like it's hard to always um, show it and prove it, and and have you know I think for a lot of former residents they weren't believed. I mean they come out of this thing and they just they didn't part of the not speaking they told me was that because no one re- I couldn't explain it I didn't have the language to explain it and no one would believe me when it happened but like what you're describing those rap sessions I mean I think of I can't even imagine you know and I've heard this so many times but what it would mean for a 13 or 14 or 15 or anyone really to be sitting there and subjected to that kind of abuse for that long um, and so one of the responses I heard from people, I'm curious to know if this was your experience, is there's a certain period of time of resistance where your mind is like, what the hell is going on? This is not normal. This is not OK. And then there's a resignation to it. Like the, there's a kind of survival for a lot of people. I mean, some folks run away and, and you know, that we, we'll probably get to it in terms of what Daniel Ewan did after just 10 days was run away, which was what many kids do it and it was a natural response to what happened but then there's kind of like a I have to survive this and resign to this environment and there's so few cracks it sounded like to um so few ways to be resistant I mean resistance was met with punishment so it's sort of like put your head down and get through it I mean is that what you found oh absolutely you could not resist anything I mean you even just from, again, being out of agreement, just peeing in the shower wasn't allowed and you would get punished. I mean, it was to this day, I will not spit my gum on the ground because in the back of my head, I'm like, I will get punished for that. So I am so careful on things that I do. But I want to go back to one thing you said, there was nothing Mm -hmm. tangible that happened to me there. You know, I didn't get physically abused. I was not sexually abused. So when people talk about CDU and if you got abused there, and I hear people that talk about this abuse that went on there, None of that happened there to me. None of that happened in the th- in the almost three years that I was there. I don't think to anyone that was at that school because it was run in a way that we were very – we would have seen it. No one's ever complained about it there at that time. But we were so abused uh, emotionally. And right. um, and when you don't have something tangible like that, it's exactly what you say said. It's you can't – explain it to anyone. You have no proof. And to this day, I try and bring it up with my mother. And, Mm. you know, she will not listen. She just says, you loved it there. What are you talking about? You did so well there. You had the best time. You had so many friends. And 
it just triggers me back to that place where I was 14 years old and I just feel like no one's listening to me and I'm just stuck in this position where I'm just like, okay, forget it. Um, and you had someone on your podcast that went by Medium, I think, who said he wrote an entire piece and for the purpose that people could use that link to send to their parents and, be, and let it right. speak for themselves. And I had to stop the podcast when I was listening and be like, Oh, my God, because I did that. I read that piece on c mm. and I forwarded that exact piece to my mother. And still to this day, she won't apologize. She won't even not even apologize. She won't just acknowledge what happened to me. And um, and that breaks my heart. You know, it's it's really tough on on me for that. But to get back to what you were asking. Um, yes, for um, it took me a while to um, get the courage up to run away. I ran away three times while I was there. Um, wow. The first time I um, didn't get very far. Um, the second time I was sent to juvenile hall um, because my mother wouldn't take me home. Um, she thought it was a great program. And um, you know, what I forgot to say before is our calls and our um, mail was monitored. So you couldn't right. write out and be like, "I this is miserable. I'm miserable. Come get me because they would not let you send that letter. And on our calls, we would have a call once every two weeks uh, or so, 10 days, and it was for 15 minutes. But somebody would be in the room listening to you. So if you said anything remotely negative, um, the call would be ended and they literally would terminate the call. And so you started to learn not to say anything awful about wanting to leave because you didn't want that time to be terminated because you didn't get it back. You know, you just right. want you were aching to speak to somebody and you no longer could speak to your friends from home. You you had no access to the outside world. So you come to realize I'm not going to ask to go home anymore because they don't believe me. And apparently I found out later the parents are given a handbook and, you know, are told, listen, the kids are going to say this, this and this. So don't respond. Here's your response. Well, no, it's so interesting because that, you know, looking at this program through a cult lens, uh, the experts I talked to said it was the parents who were groomed for the cult, not the kids. The kids were sent there unwillingly. I mean, unlike another cult where you have to entice people and love bomb them and bring them in in all kinds of ways there you have custody so it's not an issue you can't you know you could try and run away or whatever but it's the parents that you have to convince and one of the strategies is this different version of sidu that is presented to them and you know that and, and that close monitoring of information not allowing the residents of the program to say anything to their parents giving the parents a handbook i mean like that is such a and 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 um Daniel Ewan's parents, Wayne and Lisa, talk, you know, talk about this and how duped they feel felt because Daniel complained to them. He was in there for a few days. Said, this is a terrible school. And 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 Wayne said, yeah, I had the handbook. I knew that Daniel was going to say this. And I was instructed to say, OK, it's going to be fine. Stick it out. And, you know, there's a huge amount of regret and guilt and pain, I think, associated with that con, that that dupe that he felt the program pulled the wool over his eyes and, and didn't, it, it gave someone like Daniel, and it sounds like it gave you sort of no option to complain because, you know, you can't turn to any adults in your life. Right. So then you start to feel like you want to take matters into your own hands and you're like, I have to leave. I have no other option. And there were no gates. So you could leave. Right. And um, it was really only the other students who kind of would talk you down from doing this. And they would be like, well, if you're if you leave, you're going to hurt us and you're going to hurt yourself and, you know, all this bullshit, really. So uh, uh, on the third time when I attempted to leave, um, my father, my parents were divorced at the time. My father lived in Alaska and he had sent me, uh, he didn't believe in the program and didn't like it and didn't like my mother mm. and had sent me $1,000 in a Rick Astley CD. So it was considered contraband. And I opened the Rick Astley CD and I knew I was going to have to give it back because uh, we can't listen to music. And right. um I somehow saw that it was packed with something and I found the money. So I took the money out. I handed in the CD saying, oh, look, I'm copping out. I got this CD. I'm not allowed to have it. And I stuffed the money in my pocket and I immediately was like, I'm out of here. I didn't realize like I was going to run away again. But with that money, I knew, OK, I'm out of here. So I ran away a third time and I was going to go. The money was to get a plane ticket and to go see my father. So I get to the I hitchhike down the bot to the bottom of the mountain. This is a very mm -hmm. dangerous place. I mean, going down to the bottom of the mountain, hitchhiking as a single female was like not a very smart idea. But somehow I made it down, hitchhiked, got 
down to the bottom. I called my brother, who my half brother, who I had from my father's side, who I had not seen since I was four years old. He happened to live in LA. He picked me up and he was supposed mm. to take me to the airport. And he said, this seems a little odd. I want you I want to see the school. Um, and if I don't like the school, I'll take you to dad. But our father had some drug issues. So he didn't want me necessarily to go to my father's house. So he takes me back up to the school after staying with him for a couple of days and getting to know him. And uh, he goes and he sits in a room with Rudy Benz and Bill Lane and these people. And um, I sat up on in the in the couches and four hours later he comes back and he sits with me and he's like, Rachel, this is an amazing school and you have mm. to stay. I'm not going to take you back with me. And I was just like, oh, fuck, this is I'm stuck here again. And so to answer your question, that's exactly, you know, at that point I was like, OK, I'm done. This was my last attempt. I'm never getting out of here. And something in me clicked. And I was just like, I have no support. I have no way out. So I started thinking, all right, I only have a, at that point, I think I had like a year, le a year and a half left. So I was like, OK, I'm going to just try and get through this because I'm never getting out of here. Right. Yeah. Right. And so and, and you and it sounds like you graduated. I mean, you made it all the way through. I did. Okay. But I, I will say shortly after that, um, I had a phone call with my father, who, um, again, on these phone calls, they're, they're listened to. And my father has had a drug addiction. And mm -hmm. um, now that I had become the student that was following the rules, um, you draw, draw a lot of boundaries, right? And my father was high. Um, and the person that answered his phone actually was Hector Macho Camacho. He was staying at his house. I don't know if you remember him. but um, So my first like yeah. nine minutes of the call was with Macho Camacho saying, oh, we're busy. We can't talk. Da, da, da. Your father's busy. I finally get my father on the phone. And he's completely you know, blasted on cocaine and high and whatever. And we get into this argument and a little bit and I say, the woman's looking at me, or it wasn't a woman, it was a, another student, as a matter of fact, and she's sitting right. there. And I know that I have to draw this boundary. Um, because I felt like I'm here at this program, I want to do it now, right? And I said, Dad, now that you're, you're doing drugs, you've chosen drugs over me, I can't have this relationship anymore. And he said, um, you're reminding me of your mother. You're such a fucking bitch. I've never loved you. So he goes on this whole rant, really getting angry with me. And he's like, fuck mm. off, you know, and keeps repeating, I never loved you. So I hung up on him. And um, about, uh, maybe it was about six days later, my headmaster uh, had to end up telling me that my father had died of a cocaine, cocaine overdose. So that oh. was a whole horrible experience I had um, also at wow. CDU. Yeah, because I then realized I was really on my own because he kind of was my last way out. And then I right. never went home after that. Like I, after I left, I went on to another school and went to graduate, uh, to college. And um, so, you know, I realized that my life was like literally about being on my own after that. Um, so I wanted to ask you more about Daniel. Uh, Daniel mm -hmm. left after a week, right? Of being there 10 days. That's right. He, um, he was there uh, for 10 days, you know, a similar experience to you in terms of he got taken to the the, the school by his parents um, on what he thought was a tour and to kind of check it out. And and or he had gone, but sort of, you know, I think his parents said, if you don't like it, we can leave. And he, he didn't like it. He got totally um, the bad vibes from the place from the get go, didn't want to go. And they said to him, you know what? They said to the parents, Let, let's just take him to the headmaster. He'll talk to him. And it'll be a fine. And then half an hour later, they came back to the, his parents and said, Daniel's fine. He wants to stay. You guys can go. And they left. Um, uh, there's, you know, little evidence that Daniel changed his mind because uh, he 10 days later decided to do what, you know, we found out hundreds of kids like like you did, which was leave um, as opposed to run away. And as you mentioned, there's no gate. But Sidu is very isolated. It's up on up on top of the San Bernardino Mountains. There's kind of two ways out. You either go down the one road that leads to the school, and the community is very aware of the program that's there, and that will call the cops, and people get picked up really frequently. Or your other option is to go down what you, what you called the backside, which was this you know basically the side of a mountain with 
nothing there. It's kind of this very barren desert landscape. You can see San Bernardino way in the distance. You might even feel like it's closer than it is, but it's not an easy thing to get to. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of water. There's a lot of wildlife. Um, there, One theory is that Daniel did try to go down that route and didn't make it. Um, but we don't know. His body was never discovered. When the program called Daniel Ewan's parents and said that he's gone, they suggested that they hire that he hire um, they had a service uh, a private investigator that would look for the kids and they sort of outsourced the issue right away to this guy Keith Raymond who you know was supposed to be an expert in finding kids and the UN had, the UN had to fork out a whole bunch more money to hire this guy to look for their son um, and in my research or, or in my investigation I don't think this investigator was credible at all I mean I I. I sort of went and followed his footsteps and he made claims of credible sightings of Daniel Ewan in San Bernardino. He even claimed that he himself got a phone call from Daniel Ewan saying, stop looking for me. When you kind of scratch beneath the surface, none of it really checks out. And it's a case, again, it's sort of like the double victimization of the Ewan family. They first were taken advantage because they didn't know what to do for their son who was struggling, you know, with with mental health issues, not crazy mental health issues, I mean mental health I mean, or not abnormal outland, you know, outlier issues. They were it was kind of teenage depression, but they didn't know what to do, and that's where Cedo Cedo swooped in promising that they could fix fix their son. Um and then and then again, you know, they're in this moment of vulnerability, their son is gone, and suddenly this fairly sketchy private investigator shows up and charges them a bunch of money to look for their son. So it did, you know, their story was was tragic on a lot of levels, um, but spoke to how this industry can prey on on parents who are not sure how to help their kids. Yeah, 100%. Now, in your documentary, you had, or, sorry, your podcast, you had mentioned about um, that, that phone call that Keith suggests he gets or ledges he gets. Right. And I wondered, had he ever, ha- had the parents asked to listen to the to the phone call, to the audio tape? The parents had, you know, he had a very strange story about it. And I, I th- he was sort of promising to, to play it for them. And then he promised to send it to me. Uh, you know what? Actually, initially, the story changed. Initially, the story was that somebody else called and said, stop looking for Daniel. I'm his friend. That's what the, that's what he had told the parents. When I talked to him on the phone, he said, "No, no, no. Daniel called me, and by the way, he had this like I know it was Daniel because he had this kind of vague Asian accent." Now, Daniel Ewan was born and raised in New Jersey. I mean, I shared this with his friend Nick Galeta, who was his best friend growing up, and Nick just laughed. He's like, "The kid had a New Jersey accent. Like, why would he have? He was, you know, his heritage, his his lineage, his background comes from from China, but that's not what his accent was. So clearly, it was bullshit." Um, but, but I, yeah, well, I, what oh, I didn't yeah. understand yeah. is why the parents, if they're hearing that from Keith, from Keith, why they didn't demand, I want to hear this this voicemail. I, I need to hear it and go to right. the police. And, you know, instead, it seemed like they were just very happy with him and they believed him. And that made me really sad for them. Yeah. Yeah. And my sense is that that I, I, and I agree. And I'm sort of even a little bit um, torn about you know what to say about Keith because they the, the UNs do believe that their son is alive, uh, or at least they did at the time, and they had a lot of faith in Keith at least at, at the time I was making the podcast. I think that's shifted a bit, um, and he was quite manipulative. So yes, they wanted they wanted you know once they knew about the recording, they wanted the recording, but then suddenly he was had to run away from the police because he had been investigating the story too deeply and he was ruffling feathers and then he was on his deathbed um, and was too sick to respond to anything. So he had a million stories and the stories were like, he wasn't even a good liar. I mean, in my correspondence with him, I kept pressing him to say, you know, send me the tape, send me whatever. And then he said, I can't. Uh, you know, he, he had a bunch of different stories. Then he he said, I have 48 hours to live. I'm on my deathbed. I'm sorry. This is my last dance. And then I got an email the next day from the from his email account saying, "Hey Josh, this is Steve. I'm I'm uh, Keith's brother, and I see you've been corresponding with him, but I'm sorry, he's now incapacitated and he's too too ill to correspond with you." Um, so is he dead? Which was just like... Well, it turns out a few months later, you googled Keith Raymond and like his website popped up again, and he has a contact information there, and it, and it seems he is alive and well and did not die. Oh, um, my goodness. So- 
<laughs> I think he's he's a he's a, a strange and not a particularly good liar. Um, and I think you know at the end of the day, I think the 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 Ewans did start to realize that that not everything he was saying was truthful. Which is so horrible for them. I mean, I just feel for them so much because, of course, they want to have hope. And there, there is an answer to what happened, right? I mean, nobody just disappears into thin air. And But what happened with the police? I mean, why were they not more involved? Well, I, you know, a huge pattern I discovered in this investigation is the failure of authorities to do anything about this program. So, yes, you know, you, you were talking before about that primarily there was psychological abuse, but there was a lot of violations of uh, CDU's license as a um, as a program working with kids. And it, it, when we asked, we did a Freedom of Information with the California Department of Social Services, and we saw that there were hundreds of complaints made to them, and they were not followed up on, including the type A complaints, which are the most egregious. So, you know, talking about withholding food from kids, you know, physical abuse. There were also allegations. Uh, you know, one former resident said that she was repeatedly raped by two other residents and had complained to um the, the the teachers in the program and nothing was done. Um, and so what we saw, you know, and we pressed the, 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 the Department of Social Services on this and why, why did no one do anything? And we really got the runaround on it. And a lot of it is just sort of shirking responsibility. It was previous, you know, previous folks running the department, um, you know, or we have limited information. And it was the same thing with the San Bernardino police. I got, I, I was not able to get um, very far in in an accountability. I mean, for why, for example, if you're getting hundreds of phone calls complaining about kids running away from this program, are you not investigating that and potentially shutting it down? Like it's it's a waste of police resources, and it certainly is a indication that it's not a safe space for kids. Um, so we couldn't, you know, there there was a former police. There had been efforts over the years for people to try and investigate this and, and get accountability, but um, it hasn't gone anywhere. And you mentioned before. Um, well, uh, someone named Medium, who was a former resident, who had written uh, a blog post on CDU. He's actually since come out behind his. Uh, he he no longer is using that pseudonym. It's David Safran. He's a, a he has been. Um, uh, really doggedly researching this for years. He recently wrote a piece for the Los Angeles Times, and he came on board as a producer on our project. But he has been doing the legwork to try and you know file to just get more information to hold people accountable. He he had another private investigator that had stepped into uh, a prominent detective that had stepped into um, uh, the San Bernardino department and taken up this case. Um, you know, looking at past uh, abuses, looking at not just Daniel Ewan, but there's two other missing boys from the program. And she was promptly shut down. I mean, she was just like, that was whisked away from her. There, there, there seems, it appears to me, like the behavior of the police is that they're hiding something, that they know more and they don't want somebody to, to dig into this too far. Right. Well, well, also, I just remember from when we were there, I mean, the credibility factor of the kids was at zero, right? I mean, the right. the... Police thought that we were a bunch of crazies living at SeaDo, and nothing we said should be trusted. Because I do remember running away, and I think once I ran away with another girl, maybe the first time at, that we didn't get too far, we got into the town, which is just past the road, and there's a bar right. there, and maybe a phone booth or something, and a candy shop, maybe. And I, I remember the cop finding us, and we were trying to talk to him, like, "Oh my God, okay, at least." thank God, somebody we can talk to. And he just was like, no, okay, you know, and just did not believe a word we said. And we kept trying to explain, you know, oh, my God, you don't understand. I had to dig a grave with a spoon and lay in it. Like, you don't understand. This is crazy what they're doing to us up there. And the guy's like, get in the car, girls, come on, and just took us back. And we were like, oh, my God, no one understands what it's like there. And I felt like the people in the town just saw us as like these really over the top troubled kids and really didn't right. know what was going on there. Plus, the people that worked at that school also had a lot of, um, you know, their fingers were deep in that community. I mean, Dennis Dockstetter worked there, and he also owned the camp right there. I mean, when I right. later on in my, you know, years at the school, I ended up getting like an internship at his camp and, you know, spending time outside of SeaDo and working for him. I thought he was the greatest, you know, so I, right. I became really brainwashed thinking this was like, you know, where I wanted to be and who I wanted to be around. And by the way, at the end of my stay, I was the one 
running the dinner dishes committee, which was when you got in trouble, you would be on dinner dishes. You had to clean up the whole uh, kitchen and do, you know, slop the pigs and do all this crazy stuff. Right. I was in charge. So I had to decide what kid was going on, what work assignment. And I, I you know, if they were scrubbing this or scrubbing that, and I had to be the one to check them off. Um and I would have to go around and talk to each one about what they did wrong and how they feel now and do they feel regretful and then let them go back to their normal activities. So it was really monitored by the kids. And I was so, like, thinking back at this now, I was so fucked up by being the person that wanted to leave at the beginning and then at the end being part of the problem. I mean, I I was pushing them down, right? And I remember having those conversations with them being like, it's going to get better. It's going to get easier. I was just like you at the beginning. And, um, you know, the the roles just turned, but that's how Sidhu was. You started out being really rebellious and you ended up being this disciple of Sidhu. And that's kind of how they got you to graduation, you know, um, right. being the person running out of these rooms with your hands in the air, going through these profits, being like, I'm number one. And like, I don't even know what that means. Like we were, <laughs> it was just nuts. I mean, I hear the theme from so Rocky and I think of coming through the doors from the I want to live profit after we've spent two nights totally not being able to sleep and having kids hold you down and try to get up and music blasting in your ear. And you come out of this workshop and you've just been totally, you know, brainwashed for uh, 48 hours and, and humiliated and shamed and pushed to the, the end degree of like abuse. And then you come out feeling so good. I don't even know how that happens to anyone. <laughs> right. Right. I, but I mean, it is uh, the, the people have, um, you know, reviewing that curriculum. They're like, oh, this is the same. I mean, you use the term brainwashing. When the experts look at it, they're like, it is the same kind of techniques that are used in CIA interrogations, like minus maybe the waterboarding. But when we talk about sleep deprivation, food deprivation, the use of music, like all those elements that people use to brainwash or, or to, you know, to torture people, that's that that was the tools and tactics of CDU. Um and you know, you mentioned profits. Just uh, you, you know, probably just to explain. Also, I I, I couldn't. It took me a long time to wrap my head around this. But you know, you talked about the rap sessions, which happened weekly. But these profits, which if, if I remember correctly, are like forty eight hours, seventy two hours. Sometimes you're not really even sleeping at all. That you run through this very intensive form of kind of like kind of hippie, kind of CIA torture, kind of like human potential stuff um, until, you know, in Nexium, they talked a lot about these like engineered epiphanies. And it feels like that's what they were trying to do there as well, where they push people to this point of like, there's um, all this pressure to have a breakthrough and to experience this kind of breakthrough. And that like part of making your way out of CDU, from what I heard from people that went through this, was to go to these profits that were scattered throughout the time that you were there and show and prove that you were having this transformational experiences from, from you know, from these really bizarre sets of exercises that are forced on the kids that are there. Um, that part again, wild, surreal. I, you know, I, I constantly and our me and the producers talked a lot about like how do we transport people into this world? It is so strange. It is so bizarre. Again, I hadn't thought about it for years, but there, I think there was seven prophets. By the way, they're based on Cahil Gabron's book, The Prophet, and right. um, you know, there was first of all when you found out when you were going into the your next profit. It was like you were so excited. You now got to the next level and you were like moving up on the chain. And that's how you established who you were within the program. Oh, yeah, I've been through my I want to live. And people would look at you and be like, oh, my God, I can't wait to be her. Wow. She's so like, you know, she's at that level that she's done that. I mean, that kind of reminds me about what I hear about um you know, Scientology, like when you hear about people right. have hit certain levels. And again, I never thought about this before, but it was really like that. So the first one was like, the truth shall set you free. And then it was the children's profit. And then it was, um, you know, the I want to live and the values and the uh, all these ones where each one for 24 hours or 48 hours, you do not sleep. Um, 
And you go in and it's basically workshops, but they're physical workshops where you're doing really crazy things you're, um, that are stressing you out. There's a lot of crying. There's a lot of screaming. It's almost like a rap, but no one's really yelling at you, but you're doing a lot of intense work with the group, with your peer group right. that you go through the entire experience with, which is a group of like 18 people that started the school with you around the same two months. You all got there at the same time. And um, I, I can't even explain. I mean... I, the, you know, one of the things I do remember, I think it was in the I Want to Live, I sort of mentioned it before, but um, you had to lay on all, be on all fours. And then maybe a couple of the kids were instructed to put their hands on top of you. And then they said, we're going to turn on the music. And as soon as we turn on the music, do what we say. So there was an instructor, a staff member in my ear, and then an instru instructor standing with the people that were above me. And as soon as the music went on, I didn't really know what was going to happen. It was super loud. And the staff member yells at me, get up, do everything you can to get up. Oh my God, I'm sorry. And no, um, it's so horrible. And so you it's just like, you're like, oh my God, okay, so I'm on all fours and I try and get up. And obviously I can't because the kids have their hands on me and they're pushing me down. And so when the music started, the instructor yelled to those kids, push her down, don't let her get up. So they're doing everything they can to push me down. I'm doing everything I can to get up. And then the other kids who weren't picked to do it are just watching from their seats. Mm -hmm. They're crying because they're watching this happen. And mm -hmm. it's so emotional because we're all so close, right? We're all really good friends. And the staff is yelling at the kids pushing me down. Who have you pushed down in your life? What have you done to people to push them down? And the staff yelling at me is saying, who's kept you down in your life and who, who's been responsible for never letting you get up? Is it you? Is it your father? Is it your mother? What is it? And they're screaming at you. And it's so emotional and terrifying. And um, you don't know when it's going to end. And it's physically exhausting. Anyways, that was just one example of something I remember from a prophet. So... They right. were awful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bizarre. Um, and bizarre. Yeah, and bizarre. And then you're supposed to come out of them feeling like you had this big epiphany of, you know, and you come out with words like, I am forgiving. I now know that I'm honest or I now know that I'm X, Y, Z for everyone that was involved. So I will say, you know, with my experience at CDU, I... I know I'm a much more in-touch person than most of the people I know. I am so deeply connected with myself. I've never lived at home since that day. I've raised myself, basically. Um, I find that when I meet people, I am very in tune with people and their energy and who they are. I learned that from being at CDU. But I live in a much more heightened state of awareness or threat or shame or humiliation than probably most people because I'm so yeah. used to the confrontation and the and, and always feeling like something's going to happen. So the way I react towards people is also very different. I might yell when I talk and not even realize that I'm being confrontational and then be like, okay, I want to get some pizza. And people are like devastated. They're like, you were just screaming at me about something. And I'm like, no, I, I wasn't. I was just telling you how I feel, but now that's over. So like, let's go cuddle or whatever, you know? <laughs> and the, and it does not go over well. And um, right. so that kind of thing has never um, left me. But I feel like I'm good about following agreements and rules and, and boundaries, so to speak, because of that school. That's, inter that's an interesting Reflection is like one I heard both from former residents of these programs, but also from people that left Nexium um, about the process of leaving and how the, the, there's a stage of like total rejection of everything. Like everything about Nexium was bad, everything alert was bad, or everything about CD was bad, everything alert was bad, all the people are bad. Um, and then some people say, well, there's something more complicated going on. And I think even, you know, the, the experts, the ex cult experts do talk about like there's a complexity there that. You can learn things. Some of those relationships can be real. Like you know, the, the, it is not just what is those those worlds are not just what was created by the people running it, but it's also a community of people that participated. So some of those relationships are authentic. Some of the things you learn and the growth that happens can be real. And I, and I imagine it sounds like very difficult to parse out what of this is toxic and what of it's val what's valuable. Um, you know, especially inside these these programs that purport to be uh, to help people be better. 
uh, and, and being in it so long, just like there's wherever you would have been or wherever uh, someone who, who lives from the age of 14 to 16 is a really profound age, you know, to to develop and grow. And so not not all that gets to be attributed to Sidhu. You know, some of it is just what happens naturally in the development process in, in those moments. And I imagine that that can just be a really exhausting task to be like, is this bad or is this good? <laughs> Was this valuable or invaluable? And how do I figure out like which pieces to hang on to? And what I did learn from that program too is I, I do have some friends who are parents. I mean, I have a 10-year-old daughter and they're talking to me about how, you know, their kids who are a little bit older now, maybe anywhere from 13 to 18, are giving them problems. And they're thinking of sending them to wilderness schools or some sort of therapeutic yeah. school. And I feel like I'm really knowledgeable on the subject. So I stop them and I say, um, listen, what I learned from my experience in having that happened to me is that your kids just want to be heard. And sometimes the acting right. out is about not feeling like they know that their place within your relationship with them. So I think that, you know, my advice for those parents that are having a difficult time with kids, and I'm not talking about kids that are doing illegal things. I'm talking about kids that are struggling with communicating with you or you're struggling right. communicating with them and you don't know what else to do. Sometimes kids want to hear I love you. They want to hear that, that you're needed, that you're important to them, that with, you know, and I know that kind of feels gross sometimes to like a 13 year old girl and her mom or whatever, but like sometimes they do just do not feel important. And so they look for love in other places and they get in trouble yeah. and they just feel lost and they're having a hard time in school and their parents don't understand that. So instead of listening, they punish them. And I think that that becomes the problem and the kids just feel so lonely and misunderstood. And so that's what I saw from the, the entire gamut of the kid that was brought in from Watts, you know, and got in so much trouble uh, to right. the kid that was just truant and having some major problems. You know, they just didn't feel loved. Um, and so I, I would mention that to any parents that right before they think about doing the alternative. Um, so anyways, my question for you was, what did you find that finally uh, was the reason that CDU closed? Do you know? Uh, I think there was a bunch of different reasons, including in no small part that was mounting um, court cases against them. Uh, and see, so CDU Running Springs was just one of, I think, a seven programs that they were running. Rocky Mountain Academy in Idaho was another one um, where there were a number of lawsuits. So they were being dragged through the courts. Some of those were successful. They had to make some big payouts. So parents were um, catching on to the fact that this was not a good place. Exactly. I mean, it, right. It's not not good press, not good publicity for for them, um, and so it kind of you know they they had an opportunity to get bought out and they sold. Uh, I don't know you know all the ins and outs of of what led to the financial collapse, but it just it clearly wasn't helping them <laughs> that they had uh, all these court cases pending, including by the way that the UN sued them as well. Um, and they eventually sold, and then the company they sold to went into bankruptcy. And now those, I think there's one program uh, that still sort of exists, um, not run by CDU, but sort of as the last remaining program for troubled for troubled youth that that comes from that um, that's CDU Corporation. But there are hundreds that exist uh, of other um, programs in the troubled teen industry, and they exist in different. Format. So this is one. This therapeutic boarding school is kind of like one version of of the programs for troubled teens. But there's, as you mentioned, the wilderness programs, which is like the same thing, but in the wilderness and even cheaper to run because you don't have to like pay for a facility. There's the military boot camps, and then there's this kind of other scary, you know, cluster of programs that are religious based, and they get a. It's much harder to regulate because of religious ex exemptions. Um, and you kind of don't get the same oversight or scrutiny. Uh, the limited oversight that there is on any of these programs doesn't doesn't even apply in a lot of cases to the religiously based programs. So now that you've done all this investigation, would you ever send your kids to one of these types of schools? Uh, hard no. Um, <laughs> no. And look, I, I, I do. That's not to say that there. I couldn't imagine a situation where I would need support for a kid that's struggling. Uh, and we know that like mental health is a, a huge epidemic and, and was amplified by um, the pandemic. And 
and there's a big gap, especially I, I'm based in Canada. We have a, you know, a little bit more of a safety net, but in, ter- in terms of resources for youth, and mental, I mean, we, we, we have a mental health crisis here for young people as well. But the thing that I would look for is credentialed people and, and organizations that have people with master's degree and higher to work with kids. And one of the things that experts say is the best kind of help a, a teenager or a kid can get is one that keeps them in the community, keeps them in their home, allows them to thrive in the environment that they're in and not to remove them. There are cases where a, where someone does need to get removed and there are programs that are good and legitimate where that can happen, but that should really be the last resort. What, what you know, the, the most helpful thing is to find people that, um, that are experienced and trained in this and uh you know and, and obviously like the thing is that CDU was billing itself as as a solve for ADHD and Asperger's and depression and truancy like it was sort of everything a one-stop shop for everything like that also doesn't exist I think you have to be very targeted in in giving kids the kind of resources they need to address the particular issue that they're facing um so that promise which can be I'm sure is very attractive and I can I'm also a parent and um I can um, you know I can imagine the kind of stress uh, that comes along with seeing a kid struggle with a mental health issue or with anything with growing up. And so um, I, I do definitely empathize with parents that made that choice. But I do think, you know, now more than ever, we have so much, so many resources at our fingertips to do the research um, that uh, and recognize that obviously the resources are limited, but in terms of financial resources to to get kids programs. But I do think turning to people that actually have a legit background in this is helpful uh, rather than a program that that, that is a quick fix for all your problems. Yeah, that's actually very important advice. Um, So what is the latest with the Daniel Yoon story? I read that there were sightings of him in San Diego and people were saying that he may be alive. But is that just because of the ridiculous comments from Keith. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been no significant um, uh, update on on his case. I mean, it's still unresolved. Uh, the only the only um, cases where someone has come, you know, and claimed to have seen him have been related to Keith. Um, and, you know, the UNs went out there a bunch of times. I, the, the last, you know, there was an initial round of searching for him closer, you know, for the few years after his disappearance, then Keith reemerged back in 2017, I believe, saying that he wanted to reinvestigate and at that time kind of dug up some more sightings, but it's only really related to him. Um, there, there's there's no other advancement. And and it's not, again, it's da- both Daniel Ewan, but there was also two other boys that uh, at a few years before Daniel Ewan disappeared, also disappeared from the program and, and no one knows what's happened. Those are open cases. And what, do you know the details a little bit with those? Didn't they have something to do with, um, w- wasn't there a, a child molester in the area? Yeah, there was. A, so there was, you know, no, no one has proven the direct um, connection between the two, but it, what, it did come out that James Crummel, who was eventually uh, arrested and charged with uh, pedophilia and child molestation, um, had been spent time at the at the school and was at the school and had contact with the kids there and he sort of was traveling around. Sorry, as a staff member or not as a staff member. He was visiting. He was on this kind of strange. He lived with his therapist, um, and him and his therapist were traveling around to different programs uh, that worked with youth. So I, 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 he somehow had access for for some. For a few weeks, like, I don't think he was on staff, but they'd obviously paid him or, or allowed him to come into the service. So he had contact. Um, he was there around the time that that those boys went missing, and uh, and there were other um, cases of kids going missing at that time that were related to him. So one of the questions is whether uh, th- whether he was responsible. He he's no longer alive, so it's it's hard to get it directly from him. He died in jail. He died in jail. Yeah. Um, and were those kids, they had run away and gone missing or they just disappeared? Um, I believe they had, no, th- those two had run away. Okay. Um, and it was, I mean, I spoke with Blake Persley's mother um, about her story. And it is just like unbelievably heartbreaking in terms, again, of, you know, Blake, per- Blake Persley, one of the boys that had gone missing was in a... Uh, 
had an, uh, was disabled from an accident uh, as a kid and they got a bunch of insurance money to give him like really he needed really a lot of support both mental and physical and the mom got totally duped by Sidhu and claimed that they had all these resources to support him and he he obviously um, was very unhappy in the place and and ran away. But they don't know. We don't know. You know, the account is like very limited. You have these reports from Sidhu that says, you know, we saw him walk off the campus at X time and then we don't know what happened. So uh, that's Sidhu's claim is that 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 they both walked away. Wow. Um, that's just incredible. OK, so in doing your um, research on cults, you also did Nexium. Talk to me about Nexium. Explain what Nexium is to people that don't know. Um, so Nexium, it's funny because you know, when we started investigating it, really no one knew what Nexium was. I think more people do now because it got it, it was in the media for a little while. But Nexium built itself as a self-help organization um, that uh, that then the FBI kind of shut down and eventually arrested arrested its leadership for. Um, I mean, they were charged for racketeering and a whole bunch of other kinds of uh, abuses of the members there. But the uh, critics of the of the organization say it was a cult, and it really was this organization very tightly wrapped around a charismatic leader named Keith Raniere, who claimed that he had developed a philosophy that could help people, uh, you know, achieve the, their dreams and successes. Sometimes those dreams and successes were achieved by sleeping with Keith Raniere. Um, and sometimes people were done that, uh, ha- were forced to do that because they were being blackmailed. Wow. So the thing that came out of uh, Nexium that I think surprised people the most is that women were branded. And your friend from childhood was one of the women that was branded. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. I mean, that's how I came by this story was that uh, a, a woman who I have known since daycare was part of this organization for many years, uh, for I think over 12 years. Um, and she was actually their star recruiter. She lived in Vancouver. She opened up a Nexium Center in Vancouver. She brought in uh, a lot of folks from the acting and from the yoga community to be a part um, of of Nexium and take, you know, Nexium's bread and butter was running these expensive self-help workshops um, uh, that people would, you know, pay more and more money to kind of ascend through the levels, maybe un- not unlike, you know, Scientology in that sense, um, to learn to be a better person. But as you got higher up in the organization, you started to um, get privy, you become privy to some of the more um, cultic and strange activities within within the organization. Sarah was invited to become part of this secret women's group that was supposed to take her training to the next level. So she herself had spent tens of thousands of dollars on her own curriculum and self-improvement and just sort of this endless hamster wheel of like pouring in more money to deal with her her deep deficiencies. Uh, And so when one of her mentors approached her and said, hey, like we're going you're going to achieve, you know, your greatest heights and Nexium and really take your 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 training to the next level. Uh, it's part of this all women's group. And in order to be a part of it, you have to give over collateral. So things that if they came out would destroy your life. Um, and at that point, you know, that concept of collateral had been introduced previously. Um, but at that point inside the organization, it, it, it it didn't feel strange enough not to do it. And so she gave over nude photos and videos and that, you know, she's supposed to give over the deed to her apartment. Um, and she gave over like uh, she had to create videos of her uh, saying awful things about her loved ones, about her husband and about her mother. So these were things that, that then were given to the people running this little the secret women's group um, and would be released if she ever violated the terms of being involved. Uh, and it was kind of like a mini pyramid scheme inside Nexium. So people, you know, she was then the slave of a master who had recruited her and she was required to recruit other slaves into it. And it became this incredibly controlled group uh, that if someone, if your master texted you, you had to text back within, you know, a circumscribed amount of time within minutes. You know, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. You had to... um, there's a whole bunch of things that you had to constantly like achieve your goals. You had to keep re-upping on your collateral to to you know show your commitment to the to the group. Um, and then she was brought to Albany or uh, just outside Albany, where the, where Nexium was headquartered, and told that she was going to be initiated in this final step to get into the women's group. Um, 
and then discovered, you know, she was, it was a whole kind of ceremony and she was brought into this room naked. And a, a doctor actually that was part part of the group was sitting there with a cauterizing iron and uh, etched into her, like just, you know, right next to her crotch, this brand, um, which she told was told at the time was a symbol later discovered that actually it was the initials KR, Keith Raniere. Um, and when the FBI investigated this, you know, this specific secret women's group inside Nexium became a, a huge focus for the FBI investigation. Uh, and they discovered, in fact, that that he was the one running, you know, the all women's group. All that collateral was going to him. He was well aware of what was happening. And some of the women um, that were in in that secret women's group were told that they had to sleep with Keith Raniere or their collateral would be released. So it was this crazy blackmail situation. Sarah Edmondson, um, you know, the woman I knew from daycare, sort of has a wake up call around that time and decides that she's whatever the consequences are going to be, go public and leave the organization. Um, and so I ran into her. But what do you think that wake up call was? I'm I'm curious. <sighs> I, you know, I think there was a bunch of converging forces. I think if you zoom out a little bit and and look at what was happening with the organization, it was imploding. It was at the, what was happening is that Keith Bernieri is a narcissist and he needed control. And if you track what was happening over the course of the decades that it was um, operation, feeding that narcissism meant having more and more control of the people that were in the organization. And it happened in a way that was unsustainable. So for a long time, I think there were red flags. She could put it aside and just say, oh, look, we're fo- I don't want to even focus on the weird stuff. I'm just going to focus on this like great curriculum that we're learning and I'm helping people grow. But the more she got into it and the more red flags emerged and the more he had to control people, I think it, it became clear um, that this was not something she wanted to be a part of. Certainly the physical trauma of being branded, I think, was a big wake-up call. And then starting to realize actually what was happening and starting to hear rumors that he was actually at the top of this thing. She was getting bits and pieces of information that what she had been sold was not true. Uh, and I think it was it was obviously terrifying for her. I ran into her literally a month after she had left. I mean, Nexium was like up and running still. People had tried to leave before and they were dragged in the, you know, their lives were destroyed by Nexium in the same way that Scientology would go after people that defected. Nexium would go after people really aggressively. And so when I ran into her, she was like reeling and barely um, intelligible. I mean, she, she was still trying to process what had happened to her and Nexium like Sidu uses a lot of like jargon. And so she's trying to explain the story to me and I, had, <laughs> I couldn't actually entirely track it. Um, but I did track, you know, I ran to her a few times. She said, people are being branded and there's branding. And then like, but the third time I ran to her, she said, I've been branded. And she showed me. And I just thought, oh my God, like it was, it's, you know, and that obviously was like 12 years of indoctrination and that was the culmination of it. But that, that for me also was just a big wake up call about how serious, um, the situation was that she got herself into, but she went to the New York Times and like a couple months after I first spoke to her and started recording the podcast, there she was on the front cover of the New York Times showing that brand and very quickly uh, the FBI launches an investigation and, and the whole thing starts to crumble. Um, actually, as we were reporting the story, it really went from this organization that was like running full speed to the leaders are have run off to Mexico to now they're arrested and then they went to a trial. So it was quite um, a heady time and just seeing how something can kind of completely crumble before your eyes. Wow. So she was one of the original whistleblowers and helped basically get him put away, right? And now isn't he going to be in jail? He's there for over 100 years or something. Yeah, yeah I think it's 120 years in jail. I don't think he's coming out. And other people were arrested too, I think. Yeah. Yeah, there was a whole there was a number of co-conspirators. I think three of the others are are serving prison time, two are um under probation kind of house arrest. Um everyone else, no one else went everyone else pleaded guilty. Um and uh, are facing like between, I think, 12 months and, and five years in prison. Wow, it's so interesting. All right, so in your investigations with cults, with both these podcasts, I guess, with Sidu and with Nexium, what was the most interesting thing or scary thing or, uh, you know, that you uncovered for you personally? I mean, one of the things, especially doing 
the Nexium podcast and after that came out was uh, so many people came forward with stories, similar stories of being involved in a, in a cult. I didn't realize the epidemic of cults that existed. I sort of I had heard about the high profile ones and the big cases that kind of everyone knew about. But there's so many rinky dink versions of exactly the same thing. And they're all cookie cutter versions you know, they all run by the same playbook. They all have a charismatic leader. They use the same kind of tools of pressure and indoctrination. Um, and usually there's a sexual component to it and often a, a violent and abusive component to it. Um, but the the like scary thing to me was that, off, you know, sometimes it was 10 people living out in the woods somewhere, like in the Rocky Mountains, or, you know, and, and it would never... Um, get any attention. Uh, so that to me was wild. Like I literally just got dozens and dozens of emails of people. Um, and then, you know, and then there was a couple times that that we there were cases that we thought we might look into. And I started to be sort of so unsurprised. I mean, it's just back to that cookie cutter part of it. It's like every one of these things just runs the same way. Uh, and then so you, to me, when I got to the see do stuff, that was novel in a sense that because of what we talked about before. It's a surprising structure f- in terms of how they use the coercion because the kids are already uh, – th- you don't have to indoctrinate them. They're already part of the program. They're stuck there. I mean there is an indoctrination that happens, but it's really the parents that you have to that you have to dupe. Um, so that's the thing. I mean and then the other part of it is like is just the, the reason that they're so prolific and the thing that I've come to appreciate is how – the kind of universal human fallibility that 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 you know the ex the cult experts say, and I do believe that like not every person could be sucked into every cult, but every person at the right stage of their life could be taken advantage of by a cult like organization. It have to be that 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 right mix of a moment of disruption in your life, a moment of of change, a moment of um, of searching, and then the right person that the right organization comes along and scoops you up. And I really, truly do believe that there's nothing deficient or exceptional about the people that get drawn into these groups. I just think that like it's it's wrong place, it's wrong time. Obviously, some people are more vulnerable to it. Um, but I do, you know, just the fact that these organizations have existed for so long and keep popping up in so many iterations speak to that that kind of error in our hardwiring that makes us vulnerable to, to to these kinds of groups. I think that's such an important comment because, you know, I sometimes watch these documentaries or listen to podcasts or think about what I've been through. And I look at the victims and sometimes I'm like, these people are so smart. How could they have fallen for this? How could they not answer these questions with a real answer? And I get so frustrated. And then I think about my experience and I'm like, But I didn't know at the time, and I didn't know why I was doing it, and I thought these people were my family. I thought that they Mm. were my sisters, my brothers, the people that loved me, the people that cared about me. They were investing the time in me um, that no one else was, and uh, everyone else had given up on me or, you know, whatever I you know did in my head to make sense of it. And then when you take a step back, I see that those similar qualities in the people that I'm watching. So I see them fumble through questions from journalists now, and they're like, but how could you have been in that cult? Or why don't right. you have an, an answer for these things? And and they kind of are like, well, I don't know. I know why they don't know. It's just because you, you just didn't, you didn't know how to get out of it. You don't even know who you were at that stage almost. And a very smart person can get sucked in and not even realize it just because you want to be part of something more. You want to be a better person right. and you don't realize how dangerous it can be, right? Totally. Totally. It can come from very good intentions. Yeah, right. So, um, all right. So what are you investigating next that we can look for? <laughs> uh, so I actually, um, in a Surprising turn of events, I ended up taking over the kind of day-to-day operation of the podcast studio where I made The Lost Kids. So I'm, I'm, I'm now kind of overseeing uh, USG audio um, in a more of an exec, exec producer role. So I'm not doing as much on the, on the ground stuff. But we just released a really uh, a, a beautiful podcast, um, a beautifully crafted podcast about a, a really intense subject, but about a hate crime in Chicago in the 90s. But it's kind of part memoir, part investigation um, about this hate crime that occurred 
against a young black boy that was sort of going to the white side of town to get air for his um, uh, tires for his bike and is beaten into a coma. And uh, basically overnight, it becomes a national news story, but quickly flips into the story about reconciliation and forgiveness. And the host that was in his 20s at the time and was and is himself black and from the south side of Chicago and is like, what the fuck's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. Like, why are we talking about reconciliation? This guy, this kid's about to die. And he investigates the story at the time and uncovers a fascinating um uh, you know, network of power underneath that's operating. Uh, that the you know the, the 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 guy, the main kid that was charged with beating up this kid was actually the son of a very powerful um, boss who people have alleged is a is a mafia boss in Chicago, uh, and he was paying off. Uh, or or pressuring leaders in the, of the black churches to preach reconciliation and to turn the story into one about kumbaya and let's hold hands together. And it was very effective in, in pivoting the media. Anyways, it's a, a long-winded um, lo- <laughs> pitch of that series, but I highly recommend taking a listen to it. It's called You Didn't See Nothing. Um, but we have a whole slate of podcasts coming out um, and, and stuff that I'm very excited about. Great. Okay. And so, and where can they find this podcast? You find it, you know, wherever you, wherever you get your podcasts. After they listen to your pack, podcast, I'm sure it's up, uh, you know, on Apple or Stitcher or Spotify. Um, it's all available. Uh, but it's USG Audio. So we actually have a channel now that if you just punch in USG Audio, uh, the whole, our whole slate will pop up and you can kind of scroll through it. Terrific. Okay. Thank you so much. I so appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Misunderstood Podcast with host Rachel Yucatel, executive producer Kelly Brink. If you have an episode suggestion or would like to reach out for collaboration and sponsorship opportunities, email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's info misunderstood podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Be sure to like and subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts and leave us a five star rating and review because it helps the show so much. Watch full videos of each and every episode of Misunderstood on YouTube at Misunderstood Podcast. See you next time. Misunderstood.